All right, let's get started. So does, do I have everybody's uh, extra credit assignment who's planning on turning one in? All right, so uh, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to uh, get started on lecture. We're going to go over the fundamentals and background of what a digital system is, kind of remind you of some of the things you learned about in 235, uh, go over what a computer architecture is, and how do you actually apply what you learned in principles of digital systems towards what you're going to learn in this course. But by the end of this course, you will be able to actually replicate and design your own computer system. Uh, you will be learning about computer performance. You'll be learning about pipelining. Uh, you'll be learning about how to build a data path and a control system, memory systems. And also, you will take three internet learning service courses from Cadence Design Systems. Cadence Design Systems is the world's largest electronic design automation company. Most companies, Intel, Texas Instruments, uh, AMD, uh, many, most anything that you want to use to, especially if you're getting into computer engineering, use Cadence tools. So by, and basically you're the only advanced digital systems computer architecture class that has access to this. So this should be putting you uh, ahead of other uh, of your uh, colleagues at different universities in terms of getting on a, a job opportunity. So we'll be walking through this throughout the course of the semester. Um, the overwhelming majority who took the opportunity to do the extra credit assignment, I think uh, 35 of the 37 of you sent me the extra credit email. So that's good. That's a really good sign. That's a, a higher percentage than typical. So that gives me hope that this is going to be a very good class. Um, did anybody have any questions about anything that was covered in the syllabus video before we get started? Okay, sounds good. So typically what I'll do is I'll start promptly at 9.30. If I've uh, started class, come on in. If I've started class, do what he's doing. Just walk down in the seat. If you have your assignment, just come up to me. I'll be happy to take it from you after class or we discuss what happened. Typically, there's a pretty good excuse. Um, just if you've ever seen uh, the Chappelle Show sketch, don't be a habitual line stepper. You know, you know be try to be on time. I'll, I'll treat you as professionals if you act professionally. You understand? So which I fully expect, as all of you have done very well so far. So let's get started. So what is a, con what is a computer? So the whole idea is that up to this point, you've basically learned fundamentals of you learn some finite state machines, you learn gates, you learn, I take it you've learned some quine mikulski reduction, basically how to actually take some logic and build a fundamental device. A lot of that in where electrical engineers tend to say in is hardware. Right? Whether you're designing a uh, microprocessor, a field programmable gate array, or an application-specific integrated circuit, this is where a lot of electrical engineering tends to reside here. Right? So, but you eventually build some silicon, you put it through a lithography process, you eventually want it to make it do something, right? So, all of you have your smartphones, you want to actually have it work. So, you're going to have a op a operation here. The operating system that integrates with the compiler and assembler. So what are those? So the compiler takes code that you've written. I think some of you have either taken a Java or a C++ course already, right? One of those two or MATLAB, I believe they offer MATLAB as well. So eventually you write some MATLAB code or some C++ or some Java code in there. And you eventually have to get it to actually working on ones and zeros in the hardware. So that's a process known as compiling. So compiling will take it down and put it into something known as an assembly language. Now the assembly language takes what you've written in the code and makes that code representative of what's going on in the actual machine. And you learn a pro an assembly language in this course called MIPS. And from there, you take the MIPS code and you turn it into ones and zeros with the compiler. And the operating system is what communicates between the system software, which is where you're writing your code, and the hardware. So I'm going, to, you're going to be, I'm going to be emphasizing these concepts of computer architecture and computer organization in this course. So computer architecture is that layer between the hardware and software. And so what ends up happening, a lot of computer scientists, they work primarily in code. A lot of electrical engineers, they work primarily in the design of the computer system. But the people who are really good at both of them know how they interact. So this is where the primary application of your of your advanced digital systems course is going to be is how do you actually design hardware 
to write efficient code that has quality performance. So here, this has been a, uh, you'll see this, especially if you ever attend a conference with somebody from Intel, or you'll see this trend line here. This is represented of something called Moore's Law. Do any of you know what that is? Uh, you put your hand up first, I'll. Approximately, yes. So this is good. It's something that they just notice. It's not some sort of physical law. It's not like if you get hired to work in a computer and you're taken over by nature and design these computers just that. This is something that was observed by Gordon Moore, who was the first CEO of Intel, that over about every two years, they were able to double the transistor density on the computer chip. And so this is what this is representing. So what ends up happening is that causes some issues. So this is the feature size. So the feature size, if you've ever heard of the you know, micrometer and nanometer, like 22 nanometer computer chips, if you've vague, just vaguely heard that, that is the description of the size of the what's known as the poly in the transistor. Now, we're not going to go into that much detail in this course, but the whole idea is that you, transistors have three pins, and there's a gate, a source, and a drain. The distance between the source and the drain is the feature size. So when you had these large, you know, 130 micron transistors, I mean, relatively large, you're going to, they get smaller and smaller over time. So you can imagine as they get smaller and smaller over time and you have fewer and fewer electrons there to put through a channel, it causes issues at the quantum physics level. So that's what this is representing here. So as a result, your temperatures go up. So in this case here, you're having, you know, these are watts per centimeter, so basically this is your power consumption per area. So as a result, here we need the I-386, it's a lower area, and as you go up, and here, this is a typical, if you take a hot plate out of a microwave, the Intel Pentium Pro represented that temperature, and then the Intel Pentium 2, Intel Pentium 3, without actually reducing um, the temperature in the computer, you're going to keep in hotter and hotter, until eventually you're going to get to this point where it should be operating at the same temperature as a nuclear reactor, and eventually it's going to get up to the same temperature as the sun's surface, which is not good if you want to put that on your lap, right? So these are things that we have to consider as electrical engineers. How do we actually mitigate the temperature, especially as these process sizes uh, continue to decrease? At the same time, everybody wants things faster and faster and faster. You know, I'm... I'm 37. I'm old enough to remember what it was like to not have internet, what it was like to not have a cell phone, what it was like to have a rotary phone in my house, right? Nowadays, you know, I, I jokingly have a rotary phone app on my phone, which I keep next to my Snapchat app, which I keep next to my Facebook. You know, I have all these things that are really quick that you normally you'd have to send a raven in Game of Thrones back in the day, right? No. I can I can now just send a text. Go run away from her, run away from Cersei, Jamie. Right? Um, but we don't. Ha so people want things faster and faster. And if you have a an app that you know is doesn't really consider the underlying physical details of the system, it consumes a lot of computing uh, resources. You ever run an app and your phone gets really hot and the compute and the phone runs really slow? That's a poorly written app. And so if you're actually somebody who can understand how to write code and make it work at this level because you understand what you're going to learn in this course, you're not just limited to what you're going to be doing in electrical engineering in terms of building power systems or hardware. You can actually turn around and be a computer engineer or even work as a computer scientist and give a benefit that a typical computer scientist can't do. So obviously you don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. And so... This is kind of the transition of where things have been going over the last 50 to 60 years. So you used to have to deal with cathode ray tubes. And this here is the actual picture of the very first transistor. It's on display at Bell Laboratories up in Murray Hill, New Jersey. I actually got to see it this summer. Um, we have a uh, C Spire fellowship that we work with uh, where basically uh, every year the student gets to work at C Spire for an internship under my direction for the last year of the, as an, either an honors thesis or a project, and then they get to work at Bell Laboratories for six months after that. So uh, Mr. Roderick Rogers, who, is, who did very well in my class two years ago, uh, was the first person, I, I should have two, but Jason Ball and Roderick Rogers, who uh, had the opportunity to go up there, and we got to see all that. It was really neat and have lots of pictures from that. 
So now we have this point where we actually have these chips that are laid out. This is known as a system on chip. So we'll talk about this a little bit, but before we developed VLSI systems, so VLSI stands for very large scale integration, computer engineers and electrical engineers had to do, deal with something called the tyranny of numbers. And there's this idea that they believed that every port part in the computer had to be connected to every other part, which is why you had these computers that were the size of rooms. And so the innovation was the development of an integrated circuit system on chip where everything just flowed on the same chip. And from there, computers just got really smaller and smaller and smaller. And so these are new car, new technologies. These are things that people are currently uh, doing research on now. Uh, I have two research projects going on with uh, PhD students in the field of quantum computing and spin electron transistors. So the challenge is, as these transistors get smaller and smaller, how are we going to continue to improve this performance, get the trans number of transistors and decision-making logic circuits on a chip while not burning people with uh, computer chips that are the same temperature as the sun. So this is kind of where we're going, and that's where, and when you become professionals and you work in your area for a long time, that's what you're going to eventually contribute. And so uh, throughout my course, you're going to see these expert comments. I go and... Uh, go to these conferences and ask experts, what are the things that you wish uh, rising sophomores and juniors knew that you didn't know when you're coming out? So uh, they tell me and then I put them and then you get to learn them. So uh, Phil Emma is a chief scientist at IBM Research Labs. Uh, he said, the irony of Moore's law is that the designers have assumed a constant improvement in technology size and thus have not properly accounted for their implementation technology in the digital design, hurting architecture improvement. So we're going to be learning about advanced digital systems, about how to design and improve computer architectures. Not only will you learn about MIPS, but you'll have the opportunity to code one in Verilog and then learn about the pipelining with something called Tensilica. So you'll actually be, this is a concept that we'll be reinforcing quite a bit in this course. Speaking of which, we will be learning about something called MIPS. So MIPS is called microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. It's an example of a computer system, digital computing system architecture that we're going to study in this course. Now on Blackboard, under the resources page, I have what's known as a MIPS green sheet. You'll become very familiar with that during this class. And if you look at my, the syllabus, there are several course objectives. And so in this particular portion, we're going to cover objective five, which is students will learn to know the architecture of a comp basic computer system. Objective six is that you will know the operation components of a basic computer system, including control, arithmetic processor. So you're actually going to learn how you put together everything to develop what's known as an arithmetic logic unit, where you take in a control signal, and based on the control signal and two inputs, you can do an addition, it can do multiplication, it can do subtraction. Any type of arithmetic, shift left logical, you'll learn about all this in this course. Registers, how do you store temporary memory? Buses, how do you, you take 32 or 64-bit signals to communicate between different aspects of the architecture? Memory hierarchy, cache, and virtual memory design. And then objective seven, you'll know the relationship between a hardware architecture and a computer's assembly language instruction set. So this is something that you'll touch on in computer science, I think, 233, which is computer organization. But in this course, we're going to emphasize how to actually build that design from the ground up so you fully understand that architecture. And then that architecture turns into the assembly language, and the assembly language turns into the code that you that, that you bring. So you understand all of the different levels of the hierarchy, which is very important. And so this is how a computer actually kind of flows. So what you have, what, what most of what you learn in this course are the control and data paths. So the controller tells me what instruction I want to do, and the data path says based on those. Based on that control, I will receive a set of control signals, and I will execute the instruction you tell me to do. And so we're going to be learning about how to design a data path, how to design a data path to improve performance, a concept called pipelining. And from there, you have to worry about, well, what's your input? You're going to have some sort of code coming from a compiler, right? And you're going to be hearing me say this concept over and over again in the class about something called a compiler-driven encoding of the microengine. How do you take something from a uh, compiler, Put it into the controller, say what instruction I want to do, execute that instruction, update values in memory, 
and put some sort of output to the user. Because ultimately that's what's going to be important. So when we're going to be we're going to be going over how to compile some code. And I'm going to be very strict on you have to compile the code that the user gives you. So uh, sometimes you may see like, well, this might be optimized, this might be better. Well, that's all well and good. You know how to do that. Unfortunately, the coder did not. So you have to be very strict on that front. All right. So for those of you, uh, this is the first topical guide objective. Uh, basically, every class, I want you to handwrite these, defini these definitions and problems, and you'll turn them in just like you did at the beginning of this lecture. So I go over each one of them, and then I discuss them in, in detail. So the first topical guide objective is the definition of instruction set architecture. In fact, on Blackboard, I highly encourage you to look up what the TGOs actually are. So in this case, I bet you TGO 1.1 is defined instruction set architecture. So a lot of times the questions will turn into definitions. Many of them you'll see on the exam, you'll understand. I heavily emphasize certain ones that you'll be expected to know and replicate uh, in that time. So instruction set architecture is defined as a set of assembly language instructions that provide a link between software and hardware. It's a set of assembly language instructions that provide a link between software and hardware. And so for those of you, I think most of you know, but those of you who didn't have the opportunity, I video record the lectures and post them on YouTube. So if you fall behind in the notes, for example, if I, if I move on and you've only written down half of the topical guide objective, you'll have the opportunity to get the rest of it in the video. Make sense? So please don't feel, but at the same time, don't feel intimidated. If you uh, want to ask a question, I always encourage asking of questions because if you ask a question, there's a decent chance that three or four other students wanted to ask that question. And I'll have, I take plenty of time to make sure that uh, uh, all concepts are addressed. Yes? Is it safe to assume that we'll have one TGO do it at the beginning of every single class? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they, it basically, it's, it's my way of being able to quantify your studying throughout the course of the semester. And also you'll have your study guide for your exams will be set and ready to go. Oh, the other thing I, I always tell at the beginning of the lecture, when I do, typically uh, exam reviews are about five minutes, and I say, what do you think will be on the exam? And you'll tell me, and usually the students with remarkable accuracy can figure out precisely what will be on the exam. So my exams are pretty straightforward. No tricks, I don't do trick questions. I think that's nonsense. So this is another thing from uh, Henry Petrosky, uh, who's a uh, textbook author. He said, the amazing achievement of computer software industry is in its continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains by, made by the computer hardware industry. So basically, they're writing all this complex code, which offsets all the benefits that the electrical engineers come up with. So basically, the, the whole goal is, given a specific instruction set, the hardware engineer is designed to the instruction set, and the software engineer is designed to optimize to that instruction set as well. So that gives you a, a, a common goal. An instruction set architecture is designed to extract the most performance out of the available hardware technology. And typically, uh, RISC re stands for reduced instruction set computer. So the course, the specific instruction set that you'll be learning here, MIPS, is a reduced instruction set. Basically, the goal is to be able to perform all the instructions with a smaller architecture. So it's not going to be a more complex one, which is what complex instru instruction set computer is, or a very large instruction word, or a superscalar, which we'll kind of touch on at the, at the end of the course. How do you use pipelining, dual core processors? I see some of you already starting to notice the TGOs and starting to write them down. That's a good sign. So the difference between assembly language and machine language. Assembly language is the symbolic representation of the machine instruction. And so this is uh, TGO 2.2 here. So the symbolic representation is what's down here. So basically what this means is we're going to add the register value of S1, which is saved value 1 and saved value 3, and we're going to add them and store the result in saved value 2. So that's the symbolic representation. 
And so the machine language is the binary representation of the machine instruction. And so when you actually translate that out, this becomes this 32-bit value that you see here. But there, as we're going to learn, when you're bringing this down to the data path, you have these different values. So these first six bits are what is known as the control signal. All zeros means we're performing addition. And then the next five bits indicate first register. So that's 16 plus 2 is 18. So plus 2 is indicating that I want to store the value here. These next five are the sec second register. The next five are the third register. And then I have five values for what's known as a shift. We'll talk, talk about shift left logical later. But basically, if you need to multiply by two, instead of going through this complex process of going through a multiplier, you can just shift left by one for your number of bits, which is it's the same thing as multiplying by two. And then we have what's known as a function. So all what's known as register type instructions are zero. And this value here indicates add. So that and by the end of the semester you'll this is something that'll make a lot more sense so please don't feel intimidated this is kind of just a high level overview but this is kind of the you will learn how to take uh so basically if you have d equals a plus b you can actually assign a register then assign another register and assign a third register and then you actually indicate that so that's the process of translating from code to assembly so that's and then from assembly you get down to the machine language so that's kind of a brief overview of the compilation process so tgo 1.3 is this here i can tell you right now that the first question on your exam will be define and differentiate between computer architecture and computer organization and give th at least three examples of each. That will be the first question on your exam. Computer architecture is defined as system attributes of a computer that can have a direct impact on its logical execution of a program and is visible to the programmer. System attributes of a computer that have a direct impact on the logical execution of a program and are visible to the programmer. So what I mean by visible is that it's something, an aspect of the program that can be manipulated by the programmer through code. You can either do it at the high level, let's C, C++, Java, uh, Python, or at the assembly level, something that the coder can actually do. So design of the instruction set. This is something that the coder is actually doing, right? Data representation. So is it an integer? Is it a floating point? Is it a, is a character? Is it a string? All of these are different representations of data which are visible to the programmer, meaning the programmer can actually use different values to improve performance of the program. I.O. mechanisms. So, you know, for example, I have all these different I.O. mechanisms. I have an I.O. mechanism that's recording the screen. I can actually see the screen. I have a keyboard. I have a mouse. I have a cable, which is able to then go to the outside to be able to uh, go to the projector, right? These are all different things that I'm manipulating by adding them to the machine. And then memory addressing. So in the definition of computer architecture, there's going to be a difference here in memory technology. But memory addressing, in short, is how you actually program the computer to store memory. So it's the programmer is putting the value in there to say, I want the program here. Typically, it's done at the operating system level, but it is something that's done by a programmer. Does that make sense? So those are four examples of them. So the second one, computer organization, are physical details of the computer that are transparent to the programmer. Meaning you know that they're there, they're transparent to you, but you can't manipulate them through code. That's something that's hard, it's, you know, designed. So the instruction set means that I know what instructions I need to implement. But if you physically lay it out in hardware, the hardware implementation of the instruction, that's something that you can't change with code. Does that make sense? 
That's a computer organization. So that's how you organize the computer. But the architecture is how you're actually uh, putting in those attributes in ways that the programmer can come in and write code and run it on the, on the actual organization. So control signals. The controller is physically designed. So you write code. It compiles down. It takes those first six bits in. It sends it to the controller. It, the controller generates control signals. You can't change what those control signals are. And the memory technology is the physical implementation and layout of the, of the memory, as opposed to the memory addressing, which is how you tell you, it's think of it this way. The memory addressing is how the postman finds your house, but the memory technology is the actual house. So I, the, ma the mailman can put information in the mailbox, but the, ma the mailman can't actually go, well, I don't like this house. I'm going to move it 100 feet so my route is shorter. Does that make sense? So that's the difference between a computer architecture and a computer organization. And then same thing with arithmetic logic units and CPU and computer designs. So why am I insisting that this be the first question on the exam? Well, I uh, talked to Dr. Ranganathan. He was a distinguished university professor at the University of South Florida. He had a PhD student who interviewed at Intel, and that was the first question. Um, and he didn't know, the student didn't know the answer, and they just interview over. Just stopped it right then and there. So I've had a number of students interview at Intel, and sure enough, that comes up, and then they are remarkably competent at answering that question, and I get calls from the engineer going, wow, they knew that answer, that question was coming. Oh, yeah, because I don't want that to happen to you guys if that's something you want to come up. And I think it's also a very important concept, because if you're understanding what an advanced digital system is, part of the emphasis is advanced, right? You want an advanced understanding. So you should be able to understand the difference between what it is that you're designing as an electrical engineer and what you can actually manipulate as code. Not only will you know the limitations, but then you can learn all the tricks and optimizations that makes you a better coder as well as a better engineer. So I think this is a very good concept for you to ingrain, not just in my class, but as you move forward in all of your electrical engineering courses. And one other thing I want to emphasize, on the Quizzes and exams, please do, please do not say that computer organization is invisible. Please say it's transparent. In fact, I'll direct the uh, grader to give you zero points on the definition if you write the invisible. Is this invisible? Can you see this computer I'm holding in my hand? So if you go into a job interview and you say that the computer organization is invisible, well, I almost made the uh, screen display invisible there, but and if you, were so, if you were interviewing someone and they told you a computer was invisible, how would you feel about that person's ability to do work at your job? You'd think they were crazy, right? It's transparent because it's transparently, you, you know it's there, right? It's not something that you necessarily can see every little detail of it, but it's transparent, meaning you're aware of its existence, and the more that you understand, uh, the better. But it's not invisible. So I, and that's a common mistake that because it's an exam, you get a little stressed out. You know, oh, it's visible. I know the organization is invisible, and they write down invisible. But I want you to understand transparent and why we use that. It's, it's not just memorizing a definition. It's understanding what that definition actually means. And I have my joke in there. Harry Potter has not draped the invisibility cloak over it or whatever else you have in there. Right, does anybody have any questions on uh, the difference between computer architecture and computer organization? All right. So here's 1.4 through 1.6. So what is MIPS? I've kind of alluded to this. Uh, MIPS stands for microprocessor without interlocked pipe stages. So before I read the definition, remember that tyranny of numbers I alluded to earlier? where everything is connected and interlocked. So pipe stages means that there's actually, and I'll just, I'll write, write over the 1.5, 1.6, there's actually five different stages that do their own thing and then move the result over. 
So the first stage is what's known as instruction fetch, where it actually has an instruction memory, where the information goes to the instruction memory and gets that 32-bit machine representation of the instruction. Then the instruction decode kind of talks about what I alluded to with the first six bits to the controller, then the values go to the registers, then you have all the other values go down to the arithmetic logic unit and the shifters. So then what happens in the execution stage? Well, this is where the execution actually takes place. So all these values are moved over. The arithmetic logic unit actually gets a value, performs an operation based on these values, gets the result. Then data memory, I can update the result in the data memory. And then right back is where I wrap up all the information. We'll go into a lot more detail into that. So they're not interlocking. The only thing that goes between stages is information and value from the controller. So MIPS, microprocessor without interlocked pipe stages, is a general purpose microprocessor architecture designed to be implemented on a single VLSI chip. VLSI stands for very large scale integration. And what that generally means is 10,000 greater than or equal to 10,000 transistors on a chip. So the main goal of the design of MIPS is the, ex is the high performance in the execution of compiled code. Now, the reason this is important, as you'll learn as you go on advanced digital systems and move on in your career as electrical and computer engineers, is that there are trade-offs between performance, power consumption, and area. You want things to run, you know, it's the, the things you want it to run cheap, you want it to run fast, you want it to run rel, pick two. Well, it's the same thing here. In the design that you're going to learn in this course, performance is the main goal. We want everything to run fast. And so power consumption is something that is uh, dealt with later. Um, what was something that happened in the news recently involving a brand of phone where power consumption, particularly in the battery, was not properly? You know, Galaxy Note. Galaxy Note. Mm -hmm. So basically what happened here is that they tried making the access to the battery very, very high performance and didn't do appropriate testing on what happens with power consumption. So over time, it just got extremely hot and then boom, you now have a phone bomb. Right? <laughs> so last that happened last year when I was teaching this class, particularly when I was talking about the trade-offs in performance and memory hierarchy, and I was like, well, it's unfortunate for those people on the phone, but it really drives home the courses I'm teaching in this class. Like, I just went, see? See? <laughs> but in this case, we want to, because you know, reducing power consumption is basically, power consumption is directly tied to the frequency. So typically, the easiest way to drive it down is frequency or reduce the supply voltage. Uh, but in this course, in order to really understand the advantage of the system, we're going to really emphasize performance. And so to that end, the basic philosophy of MIPS, and by the way, I should state that uh, one of these three is going to be on the exam more than likely 1.6. Basically, I'm sorry, the basic philosophy of MIPS is to present an instruction set that is a compiler-driven encoding of the microengine. Thus, little to no decoding is needed and the instructions correspond closely to microcode instructions. So what ends up happening is you get your C code or you get your C++ code or you get your job code or whatever you're going to run and the compiler compiles your code down to that assembly language representation and then the machine language representation. That's where the compiler driven encoding comes in. So once you get that machine representation you just have to run it through the data path. You don't have to do extra weird decoding other than taking that six bits at the beginning and indicating that which instruction you want to run. So there's little to no decoding. It actually will run it through. You take those five bit values. The five bit value, the register is an address. 
Do you remember memory addressing? We talked about that as a portion of the computer architecture. Well, since we have five bits representing registers, that means two to the five, which is? 32. So basically anything between, uh, just for, for future reference, you should be able to say anything from 2 to the 1 to 2 to the 10, you should be able to state pretty fast. So 2 to the 6 is 64, 2 to the 7 is 128, 2 to the 8 is 256, and so on, right? So that's just something that as you practice more and more, you'll get very used to. But 2 to the 5 is 32, so I have 32 registers. So that's an example. Of, I know I can code in the assembly language, which register I want to use. So that's an example of computer architecture. So I don't have to decode very much. It'll just go straight there. The architecture will find the specific one for me, pass it along to the arithmetic logic unit. I don't need to decode that either because the value is in there. And so the whole idea is fast and simple. So that's why when I had RISC earlier, it stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. So you'll be happy to know even this is this course can get pretty uh, intense sometime that we're choosing the reduced version in your introduction to this, right? Because it's, it's a really good one for instruction. You learn all the fundamentals, but it's not an insane, it's not insanely large. Okay. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Yes. Sure. Sure. Uh, the term very large scale integration, uh, why the specifier is very large? Okay. Is, is there a large scale integration? And yes. Very large? Yeah, um, it, it's, uh, I don't know if I have it in here. No, it's not. In the, basically, in, I teach a course called CMOS VLSI design. So small scale is anything from 0 to 10 transistors. Medium scale integration is 10 to 100. Large scale is 100 to 1,000. I'm sorry, 1,000 to 10,000. And very large scale is 10,000 and beyond. So that you, yes, that it, uh, that it, there are actual. Um, so basically, uh, if we're designing, you remember JK flip flops from 235. So that's an example of SSI. That's a small scale integration. So then I want to actually design a 24 hour up down clock, right? So you're using several JK flip flops to count up to each number in the clock, right? So now you're building up. Okay, one of the values can be, you know, medium scale integration. Then you're putting them all together, it becomes a large scale integration. So now in this course, we're actually going to be learning how to design a computer chip that does a lot of these things for you. So that's where the very large scale integration comes into play. So how do you keep all that together? How do you run it fast and efficiently? How do you store all the information when you're done with it? That's all part of the advanced digital system. It's a good question. Anything else? Okay, uh, what specifically? Okay, well, let me, uh, actually, the next paragraph happens to be the answer to your question. So, the RISC architecture is simple in both the instruction set and the hardware needed to implement the instruction set. So, this, the whole idea of this basic philosophy is that we're taking some code in, we need to de you know, compile the code, so that's the compiler-driven encoding of the micro-engine, and then run it with high performance and low area. So it needs to be relatively simple and it needs to be able to run fast. So that's why we have low to two decoding, right? Low to no decoding, it needs to be able to be decoded, I mean, sorry, uh, compiled and then run right in the machine. And then, although MIPS has a simple hardware implementation, uh, the user level instruction set is not as straightforward. So we're talking about there's always trade-offs somewhere. So this is where your trade-off is. In order to have it run quickly, once it's uh, compiler-driven, the compiler tends to have a little more complexity. But that's something that we'll, I'll uh, cover a lot more, but particularly in section three. Yes? Is that paragraph part of the... No, no, no um, I'm sorry. I should be... Yeah, the end of uh, 1.6 is here. Any other questions? Did that, did that? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so 1.7. So this is where, how we talk about how data is operated upon in the, in the architecture. So data may be operated on only when it's in a register or only load and store 
ex instructions access memory. So registers are these local copies of memory. Uh, I described it in more detail in number one here. Repeated use of registers in a basic block prevent redundant load store. So what is a load store? Does anybody have any idea what a load store might be? All right, that's, that's perfectly fair because it's a higher level concept. So I am the data path, right? I am performing instructions. You are my local registers. I want to do an addition. You have my two numbers. I add your values, and I want to store your values. You're going to be where I result. So B equals A plus B, right? I get A, I get B. I'm the ALU. I perform an operation. I store D. I need D for something else later, right? So D times 5 becomes Q. So now I, you're... Your here, your times five, right? These are my local copies. These are the registers. These are the repeated use of the registers. But eventually, at some point, the computer is turned off, and I need to store it in what's known as, known as non-volatile memory. Something that, you, because once the computer turns off, you're you're you don't store anything. You're done. You are my more complex data memory. So you are going to the operating system is saying. These are all the values that have to meet each other to perform my function, right? So I can perform a similar load store. I have this value in the head and say, what do I need to perform this program? We need the value for A, we need the value for B, we need the value for D, and we need to have the Q's eventually going to be used, right? So I will take all of these from the non volatile memory, they give me the information in what's known as a load. So I'm loading this values into the local faster cash registers. You perform all the operations. We're done with them. What do I have? I've updated Q, so I go to Q. I then update it at the end instead of, of, instead of having to constantly go, all right, are you guys done? Are you the same? Are you the same? Yeah. That would be highly inefficient. So we don't want to do, so taking this value at the end is what is known as store. So it's oftentimes in the, in the concept of, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. So what ends up happening in, off, in operating systems is that this, con this going back and forth between the non-volatile memory and doing extensive load storage is a concept known as thrashing. If you're doing more operations going back and forth between the memory than actually performing instructions, that's not good. So we want to reduce that by using the registers as much as possible. So this first one, the repeated use of registers, is a basic, in a basic block of code, prevents redundant load stores and redundant addressing calculations, which we'll learn about in dealing with the ALU. So I have to figure out exactly which ones I need to go to in my memory before I can put them in registers. This allows higher throughput since more operations directly related to the computation can be performed. All right, what is your question? Um, is this related to the idea of temporal locality? Yes. Yes. We will, in, in memory, we'll go over, uh, in section six, we will go over quite a bit of detail on temporal and spatial locality. So with the concept that he just discussed, there's two definitions that you'll learn later in the course, temporal locality and spatial locality. Temporal locality is the idea that in if you use a specific variable, odds are good you'll use that variable again in a relatively short period of time, right? So for example, I did A plus B equals D. So odds are good I'm going to go back to get this value in my program, right? You're not just going to calculate it for no reason. You're going to use that value for something else. So that's temporal locality. And spatial locality means that the values in the memory tend to be close to each other, right? So you notice how all, I try to use these values that are closer together. The computer architecture will naturally bring these values really close to each other. So that's another way of using the ideas of registers and uh, loads and stores. And so the second one, a simplified pipeline structure has a fixed number of pipe stages. So in MIPS, it's five. Instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, memory, and write back. We'll go over that in more detail later in the course. Each of them have the same time length. And this is going to become important because... We're gonna, you want to have a high frequency. So if you have five stages, you want it to be just longer than the longest operation takes. So that way, that one's completed, and then you're immediately ready to move all the values to the next pipe stage. 
A simplified pipe structure has a fixed number of pipe stages, each of the same time length. Because the stages can be used in varying but related ways, pipelining utilization improves. So a highly efficient execution of compiled code. That's where tying in these pipeline stages ties in with using registers and only updating the non-volatile memory and the higher those higher levels of cache when you absolutely have to. So there's a whole section in this course where we'll talk about uh, set addressing, byte addressing, um, how those different uh, levels of cache work. This is a general overview. So uh, for 1.8, I'm going to scroll down here. I, I'm guessing everybody's got through number one. So I'm, if you're catching up, I can, I'll leave two at the top. But 2GO 1.8 are the definitions of the five stages of the MIPS data path. Now, as you'll see, especially when we get into Tensilica in, um, uh, in the instruction, in the ILS courses later in the semester, uh, sometimes there'll be seven stages, but they'll dedicate two stages to performing different types of the same thing. So they have two instruction, two execution stages and two data memory stages to try to split those stages up so that way they can improve the uh, th throughput of the machine. So let's say the execution stage took 100 cycles, data memory takes 80 cycles, but then instruction fetch and instruction decode each take 20, and write back takes 20. If you split these up, you can actually re re improve your throughput. Instead of having to have 100, uh, uh, cycles, you'd have to, you'd have it narrowed down to 50, so you're doubling your uh, your your performance. So the instruction fetch stage. So this is 2.8. I mean, sorry, 1.8 here. Instruction fetch gets a compiled MIPS binary machine code instruction from the instruction memory. So after it's compiled, it's all put into the instruction memory. So that way, the instruction memory is what is the compiler-driven encoding of the microengine and loads it into the data path. So you recall from the five easy pieces, you have the controller, data path, input, memory, and output. So the input and memory comes from your instruction memory in the instruction fetch stage. The instruction decode decodes the machine instruction and I gave you an example when I showed you that machine instruction example of the 32-bit values, right? The six bits indicating the uh, opcode and the register values and then the, the function. Decodes the machine instruction and generates the control signals, determines the appropriate registers and memory locations and the necessary operations to complete the instruction. So think about this way. The instruction decode state is what I was doing over here with y'all when I was describing registers, right? The opcode told me I was in RTEC instruction, so I need registers. The function told me I'm in addition. So, and then the three registers told, told me that you two would be the ones I needed for addition, and you're the one I needed to store the results in, right? So that's what all of that means. It's decoding the machine instruction. I know which one I needed to do. Generate the control signal. Tells me what to do. So if the control signals generate add, I shouldn't be over here saying we need to subtract, right? We say no, that the controller, the positive driven encoding the micro says don't do that, that's bad. You get wrong values. Determines the appropriate registers, as I've described here, and memory locations, and the necessary operations to complete the instruction. So execution in ALU performs the operation dictated by the machine instruction. Pretty straightforward. This is the control signal, does the result. I will spend section three talking in detail about the actual um, results of the uh, of how, how to actually design an ALU. Data memory. If the operation dictates that some information must be stored in memory, it will be done at this stage. So that's where load and store operations come in. Right? So load and store operations. If I need to store some values back in non-volatile memory, or if I'm doing a whole new program, let's say we've done the addition, I've done the results, I go back here. I store my re results in non volatile memory in the phone. Then you could use this as I don't want to use the calculator anymore. I need to use Snapchat. So 
So here, this is the cache memory and non-volatile memory I have to load into Snapchat. Then I load that into my data path, into my register. So now, instead of needing all the stuff in the calculator, so I will have all the addresses of my friends, and I have a processor to set and control how I'm going to use the peripheral, such as the camera. Uh, I can upload all the different, uh, whatever they call those things, the, uh, the covers, the, the filters, right? So they look like a bunny or whatever, or something like that. Uh, um, and you have all that information stored here. And then when you're done with it, it's loaded back in. So you want to minimize this. I'll get the question in a second. And then finally, write back. If the operation dictates that some information must be stored in de temporary register, it will be done at this date. So I take the values from my from my addition register on the ALU. I perform that operation. Write back is when I'm storing the value of Q back in the register. Okay, what's your question? Very good. Answer it. Awesome. Any other questions on this? I, I, I just, just uh, this is one of those, uh, one of the things that you'll uh, see, I think one student wrote me back and said that his father was an instructor in uh, nuclear power school. So one of the uh, things that they talk about, you got to a really difficult concept, and uh, but we cover it in more detail later, is just draw the giant I believe button. So I understand that these concepts of instruction decode and data path and cache memory and non-volatile memory, we'll get there. So just for now, I believe, Dr. Morrison, I believe. Okay. Let's see, I'll just um, make sure. I just saw you're still writing. You're still like, yeah. okay. So I'll try to uh, see. If I can. There we go. I can zoom in a little. There we go. Okay. So basically, this is a general layout of the data path, and it's actually describing these, these different types of data paths. So this instruction fetch. I have this instruction memory here. And I have what's known as PC, which stands for program counter. So I have a number of instructions, right? And my program counter tells me which instruction I'm going to do next. So normally you just go through the next instruction, next instruction. But you're all familiar with if statements and while loops and for loops, correct? Is there anybody in here who's not familiar with that concept? All right, good. So if you're doing a, a while loop or a for loop, you have some sort of conditional statement. And then if, the, if it meets the conditional, it does the code in there. And then what does something what's known as a jump back up to the instruction before. So the program counter says, OK, you need to go back here. You don't actually continue going, right? So that's what the program counter does. This instruction memory contains all of those machine language instructions. Are you, are you done with that? Okay, awesome. Yeah, also, if you're, if you're falling too far behind, uh, let me know. Uh, I'm, I, I usually kind of do a scan of the room. If I see someone scribbling, I'll usually take a second. So this is the data path. So this is your instruction memory. This is your instruction fetch stage program counter. And then this adder here we'll discuss in more detail later in the course. But basically, this takes the value of the program counter and adds one. So I need to come through with my next instruction, right? The reason we need to propagate this through is because we're eventually going to be doing decisions on if statements and while loops and for loops here. And this allows me to say, OK, well, if I, if I have an if statement where I need to branch past all those values, I need to have that value. If it's six instructions in there, I add six. But here we add one. So basically, instead of doing the last instruction in there, it becomes plus seven, and you go to the instruction one past the while loop or the if statement or the for loop. So here, these buffers, so IFID, this is the buffer between instruction fetch and instruction decode. So you get the register, I'm sorry, the instruction comes out here, clock cycle occurs, it moves on past the buffer, so then it goes to the control signal, 
register RS1 and RS2. Those are, uh, I'm sorry, I heard my two things were there. I keep pointing at you guys. But RS1 and RS2 are A plus B registers, right? So that goes here. And then it puts the results out, what their actual value. So those five bit values are, I know it's chair number one and chair number two. So that the actual value could be 256 plus 982, right? Could be whatever it happens to be in there. So I put those values out, and then it goes to the arithmetic logic unit. And we'll discuss in a lot more detail what these multiplexers are. But basically, um, there's a difference between getting two variables. And let's say instead of A plus B, I have C, and I want to add 7. So let's say C plus 7, right? I would actually have a value where the 7 is stored in the instruction. And I get the value from C. C comes out, I add what's known as an immediate value, and then take that and I make the decision there. From the arithmetic logic unit, we execute. If I'm, I make the decision, so for the branch, for if statements, while loops, you make some sort of comparison. The ALU also does that for you. If it meets the condition, if the branch is taken, that means we are going to go past the instruction and that result then tells me where I need to go so you see here it says next PC I actually make a decision on where is it just the next instruction or is it the next instruction plus a number of different values here the ALU remember I talked about load store calculation the ALU can tell me precisely where in the non-volatile memory I need to store that information and then I would actually get that value and store it this way and then the right back is if I go from the ALU, go around the data memory, and then right back to the register here. So that's kind of a general high overview. You caught that one quick. I'm notorious for dancing along with ringtones. Everyone's like, no, 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 I don't want to see you dance ever. <laughs> All right, so 1.9. So the MIPS instruction set architecture uses an, an instruction, an, let's get rid of that, an instruction format and is, that is classified as a reduced instruction set computer. So I talked about RISC and CISC really briefly. We're going to find them more uh, in more detail here. The MIPS instruction set architecture uses an instruction format that is classified as a reduced instruction set computer. So it has a fixed instruction length. All risk, sorry, all risk machines have fixed in instruction lengths. In this case, in the one we will use in our class, every single instruction is 32 bits long. Whereas complex instruction computers can have several instruction lengths. You have 32, you can have 64, uh, depending on what specific instruction you're trying to do. So for the difference, a good example of um, risk versus sys. Let's say I want to add a, a plus b plus c equals b, right? When we reduce instruction set computer, I'm doing two additions and I can store it what's known as a temporary register. So I can take a plus b, store them in a temporary register, and then I take my temporary register plus c and then store it in b. And a complex instruction computer, I can actually designate a longer instruction that says give me a, b, and c and I will add an ALU from them together and get B. So the, the, there's pros and cons to this. It's risk is simpler. I think that's, yeah, simpler, limited number of addressing modes and instruction types. So instead of having to design a number of different adders, I just have one adder and I perform them faster, right? So that's where the high performance execution of compiled code comes in from the, uh, you know, the, main, the basic philosophy and can be executed in a single cycle, therefore you have higher clock frequencies. So one, slide, one cycle, execute A plus B, one cycle, they put it in the temporary register, the next cycle, I add temporary register in C and store it in B. So that could be two cycles. Now compared to the complex instruction set computer, which is where CISC is, so many instructions. So in this case, I think 
Yeah, in MIPS, there's 64 different instructions that can be executed. And all you can perform anything that a computer does by just using some combination of these 64 instructions. So you have to have higher performance because you need the instructions to run faster. So the instructions are simpler. So if I'm multiplying five numbers, it turns out I'm just multiplying two, then I'm multiplying that value times the third one, times the fourth one, times the fifth one. Whereas complex, you can make them have these arithmetic, several arithmetic logic units. And uh, if you ever take an advanced you know, computer architecture course, uh, you can learn about something called Tomasulo's algorithm, which actually uses pipelining in a complex instruction set computer to significantly reduce uh, the amount of the execution time, which significantly improves performance while using several different ALUs. So as I alluded to earlier, there's variable in, uh, instruction length, which makes them more complex. And instruction may take several ex cycles to execute just because of the nature of the specific instruction. And I'm going to scroll up just past the first definition of MIPS there so I can talk about the four design principles. <laughs> so these four design principles are something you're going to remember as an electrical engineer or as a computer engineer or if you get into computer science or whatever it is that you want to do in our field. This is something to remember as you move forward. Simplicity favors regularity. So for example, I think I'm going to pick on a couple other people so you guys don't feel like I'm constantly doing you that to do that. So if I'm adding the five numbers here in these five registers, right? It something complex requires a big adder if I had to bring it all together, right? That's pretty complex. Simplicity favors regularity means I want to do the simple thing regularly. So I want to add your two values, just make it simple. Then I can just add that value plus you, plus you. Plus you. See the regularity in what it is that I'm doing? And that's simpler than trying to figure out how to get all value of these values together. So that makes it small. It means we only, you just use the compiler driven encoding of the micro engine to say add again, add again, add again, add again, add again, right? Smaller is faster. Now that we no longer deal with the tyranny of numbers, any, any, if you're trying to think of it this way, if you're you're going on an obstacle course and you go through eight obstacles as opposed to 45, which one do you think is going to, you're going to run, which obstacle course do you think you're going to run through faster? The shorter obstacle course. It's the same thing with computing physics. If you just do this, if you're able to get through the data path faster and complete the result, more often than not, it's going to be smaller, which is where you have your area and performance trade offs. You also, when you're designing, you want to make the common case fast. If you are designing a program, or you're designing a computer architecture, or an advanced little system that seems to do the same thing over and over again, you don't want that to be your slowest feature, right? If you're doing something repeatedly, you want it to be fast, because that's the thing you do the most. That's your benefit. Like, hey, this is the thing we do the most, and hey, we've mastered this. It's just, it's good practice. And then good design demands good compromises. There is no perfect answer in our field, unfortunately. Otherwise, we probably would figure it out, and then you guys would be majoring in something else. Right? But, the, but that's good, though, because when, you have, there's, when people want certain things, you have to design your concept around what it is they actually want. You know, when, if you've ever been in my office, when we come to my office hours, on the big side of my office is better is the enemy of good enough. And what that means is, as engineers, we tend to think of these really cool ideas and come up with all these great things that we want to do. But is it the thing that the customer wanted? We have all these bell and whistles, but it doesn't do the thing that the customer wanted in the first place. You didn't actually do the thing that you needed to do. So figuring out what it is that the customer wants and design to that. And sometimes it requires good compromises. We just got a big grant from the National Science Foundation where I'm taking the cadence tools and de designing a number of different versions of the computer architecture 
with trade-offs for power performance area and were known as, as energy imbalances, which can be exploited for security side channel attacks. So typically, an IoT designer, a, a study uh, came out recently that 85% of designers in, for Internet of Things devices have felt pressured to put devices to market despite having significant security reservations, right? So that's because the people who are running your manufacturers just want to get these devices out there and make profit, right? They're, they're worried about a different kind of cash, right? But if I'm able to hack into your device, that makes you end up losing a lot of money. For example, um, there was a somebody designed these sensors which were able to regulate a fish tank in a casino. Well, they didn't put any kind of security measures in there at all. And people were able to hack in and rob the casino through the fish tank <laughs> because they did not think about good design demands, good compromises. You think about, okay, this costs a little more, but do you really want someone to rob your entire casino because this fish needed to breathe? So these are the things you need to think about as you're designing an advanced digital system in your career. And that's the funny version. It's when people are able to hack into baby monitors and to insulin pumps when things get really serious and really unfortunate. So um, we are going to stop here. Your assignment that's due on Thursday is TGO T1.1 uh, through 1.10. I will post the video and send out an email with the assignment. Before you leave, I'm going to stop the video and I need to do the attendance.